Welcome to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age, the show designed to help make middle age your prime time of life by defying the notion that once you reach 40, 50, or even 60 years old, your crowning achievements are all behind you. Regardless of whether you're just approaching 40 or are firmly entrenched in your middle years, it's time to launch your very own personal journey toward a joyful and purpose-filled second half of life. Each week, host Roy Richards, an expert on midlife renewal and author of A Midlife Challenge, Wake Up, will discuss the challenges common to middle age and help guide you to a brighter tomorrow. Now, here's Roy. Hello, and welcome one and all to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age. And today we're going to talk about chronic pain, a condition that uh, unfortunately impacts many of us at middle age on occasion, but sadly it impacts a few of us continually for long periods of time, perhaps all the time. And this chronic pain most often occurs in the lower back, but it may be centered elsewhere in the body, a shoulder, a leg, the neck, any place where pain throbs and won't go away. But today we're going to concentrate on the lower back since this is the most common location, and lower back pain may be so persistent that it puts you flat on your back unable or unwilling to participate in robust outdoor activities that uh, help most of us unwind this time of year. And if you, a loved one, family member, or close friend suffers from debilitating back pain, today's program is for you because my guest, David Hanscom, M.D., is an orthopedic spine surgeon who has been performing complex spine surgery since 1986. But ironically, Dr. Hanscom now concludes in his own words that most spine surgery should never be performed, and hundreds of thousands of back fusion surgeries are performed in the U.S. annually, but pain is overcome by surgery in less than one-third of the cases, believe it or not. And following surgery, so many chronic pain sufferers wind up with little or no pain relief, and a few unfortunate patients end up with severe deformities or the need for continual back surgeries. And Dr. Hanscom is here to reveal how stress and anxiety are at the core of most of our chronic pain suffering. And here's Dr. Hanscom's bio. He's a a renowned orthopedic spine surgeon for over 30 years, but now concentrate on helping others avoid surgery. And he was a fellow sufferer himself who uh, shares with others what finally pulled him out of the abyss of chronic pain after 15 years and has perfected a new treatment model that has helped hundreds of patients move from managing pain to becoming pain-free. And he's best-selling author of the groundbreaking book, Back in Control, A Surgeon's Roadmap Out of Chronic Pain, now in its second edition, and he's frequent guest on radio and TV talk shows including the Dr. Oz show, which my wife loves to watch, and he's a sought-after speaker at medical conferences around the world. Hello and welcome, Dr. David Hanscom. Uh, We are indeed honored to have you with us here today. Well, thank you, Roy. I appreciate the introduction. You uh, you really helped get things started here. But, yeah, it's uh, become a passion of mine for for two reasons. First of all, you know, the medical profession views chronic pain as something to be managed, not solved. Yeah. The neuroscience research has showed us that it's a solvable problem, number one. And then, second of all, the surgical results, as you just mentioned, are dismal. And so we're ignoring the principles that create the solution. We're implementing surgeries and procedures that actually make things a lot worse, a lot more expensive. Hmm. And the diversion got to the point where I just literally quit my practice at the peak of my career to go out and see what I could do to change the structure not of surgery. Because the last five years, spine surgery has just come, maybe in the last 10 years, spine surgery has just gone way out of control. Mm. And it's, 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 it's unbelievable. So I finally, I was seeing three to five patients every week that had surgeries either done or recommended on relatively normal spines. Oh, wow. And the success rate of a spine fusion for back pain is about 20 to 30%. Yeah. And we also notice, and we'll talk about this later in the, in the conversation, yeah. that when you're in chronic pain, your nervous system's fired up and sensitized. When you perform another procedure in the presence of chronic pain, you can induce chronic pain at the new surgical site up to 40% of the time. Mm. For instance, if you have chronic back pain and have, for instance, a gallbladder operation, Mm. which is generally pretty painless as far as recovery, et cetera, you can induce chronic pain at the gallbladder site up to 40% of the time, 
in 5 to 10% of the time, it can become permanent. Oh, so wow. your chances of making yourself worse with back surgery is actually almost double up of making you better, yet we're doing somewhere between three to 500,000 operations a year for an operation that probably should never be performed. Well, can you tell us why lower back surgery for so long, the medical community's ultimate treatment option for chronic lower back pain, why does so often that fail to bring sufferers significant relief? You know, to be honest with you, I honestly don't quite know. I trained in Hawaii, University of Hawaii, in 1979 um, to 81. I'm sorry, 1981 and 84. Yeah, 1981-84. And I actually watched it sort of come across the Atlantic. There's a paper out of Australia that, that said, well, if you inject that into the disc and the pain matched the patient's pain pattern, oh. that a fusion would solve the problem. The problem is that not only did the data never ever pan out, it became an epidemic of spine surgery based on no data. And so what happened, the only paper that remotely suggests spine surgery is effective was published in 2001. Oh. And even the success rate then was only about 20, 30%. But it was better than doing nothing, so they said, well, it's a reasonable operation to do. It turns out that if you consistently engage in chronic pain treatment as a multifaceted process that's self-directed, with engagement, it's probably 90% solvable. Oh, and wow. it's so it's just not, and it, plus it's no risk, essentially no cost. So it's not very hard to do. It's basically utilizing very well documented, proven medical treatments. It's not new stuff, it's already been there. Hmm. But the data also shows that there's a research paper out of Baltimore in 2014 that shows that only 10% of surgeons, spine surgeons, are actually acknowledging, acknowledging the risk factors that pretend a poor outcome before they recommend or perform surgery, 10%. Wow. So there's essentially not one paper that says spine surgery works for back pain. There is plenty of data saying that other modalities do work. And somehow we keep going along at an ever-increasing rate of surgery for something that has no data to back it up. And as we go along, in the last 10 years, I keep looking for a paper that said, yeah, this really does work. <laughs> but what happened to me personally I've been I'm one of those few surgeons who's actually on both sides of this fence. Yeah. I spent from 1986 to 1993 being, I would call a zealot, really actively performing fusions. I was excited mm. about it. I would feel guilty if I couldn't find a reason to do the fusion. Yeah. We were performing a test called discography back then where our radiologist would, would inject some dye into the disc, pressurize it, and if it would hurt, we would go ahead and fuse it. Mm. Well, the data came out in 1993 that... The success rate of a back fusion for back pain in the workers' comp population was about 15% at one year. I thought it was 90%. I, I had no idea it was that low. Yeah. I just immediately stopped. I just said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I stopped, but I actually didn't know what to do. From about 1993 to 2003, I went into this horrendous burnout chronic pain myself. And I didn't really, I was just trying to survive. But... What happened, I don't know why it went into chronic pain. I wasn't really sure how I came out of it. I came out of it pretty much by accident around 2003. Hmm. Do another five years to somewhat figure out how I got into it, how I came out of it. The last six or seven years of neuroscience research is very, very compelling as to the nature of chronic pain. Hmm. And by understanding the nature of chronic pain, it's actually a solvable problem. Hmm. What's ironic about back surgery right now for back pain is that we only know between 5 and 10% of the time where the pain actually comes from. Yeah. Okay, and then exactly. we, um, and we also know that disc degeneration, bone spurs, arthritis, bulging disc, rupture disc, yeah. those have actually been proven to be not a source of pain. Oh. Oh, Yet it's the most common reason we actually perform refusion for back pain <laughs> on a structure that's actually been proven to not be a source of pain. So and it's not, too not only surprising is why there, only 30% 30, 30 or so people reduce their back pain from right. the surgery. <laughs> right, and I just had a conversation on a podcast with a guy named Ian Harris, who's North Peak Surgeon of Australia, mm. and he, again, I keep asking people, well, where's the data that says we should be doing a fusion for back pain? There's many procedures in medicine that are probably overutilized but still effective. He and I both think amongst many people that a back fusion for back pain is probably an operation that should never be done. Hmm. And it's almost, I mean, there's no data. It's not, literally not one paper that says that it works. Yeah. Not one. 
But and it brings in good just, money. <laughs> brings in good well, again, what's <laughs> ironic is that the spine services are considered the number one revenue generator of a given medical system. Mm-hmm. That's been that way for a long time. Hmm. Well, surprisingly, you point out there's a direct connection between stress and anxiety and chronic physical pain. That uh, stress right. and anxiety are at the core of most of our problems. Can you please uh, briefly describe this connection? What role does emotional dysfunction play in chronic pain? I never realized there was one. Well, that's where medicine has missed this because what's happened in the last 10 years is that, just for example, I'll just go through a little bit of a sequence here for about five minutes, yeah. is that the way the human organism survives on this planet is that we take in sensory input through all the receptors, then our brain automatically directs us in a way to behave in a way that's safe. Yeah. You know, we're not staring into the sun. We're not sitting on surfaces that are too hot. We're not drinking, you know, we're not drinking water that may be tainted, et cetera. So our, our body's always on high alert, processing data to keep us safe. Yeah. And it's estimated that the unconscious brain processes about 11 million bits of information per second. Oh, wow. So every second, we're just automatically staying in a, in a safe zone. The creatures that didn't pay attention to these environmental cues didn't survive. Yeah. What happens if there's a threat, let's talk about a physical threat with any living creature, including humans and, and, and any animal. If there's a physical threat, your body goes on high alert by secreting adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, histamines, and other stress chemicals. And what happens is that your body is now flooded with chemicals that allow you to escape more quickly. Once the threat resolves, the chemicals drop and you move on. Yeah. Now, what happens is that when your body is full of stress chemicals, what you feel is anxious. In other words, anxiety is not psychological. It's just the descriptor or the symptom that yeah. describes the state of your body's chemistry. I see. For example, if you're lying on a beach, relaxed in the sun, just hanging out, your body's full of oxytocin, the love drug, dopamine, yeah. the reward chemical, serotonin, the antidepressant, and then GABA drugs, which are like Valium. When you're relaxed, when you're in that state of mind or that state of body chemistry, the description for that is relaxed, right? Oh, yeah. But you wouldn't call relaxed a disease or a diagnosis, correct? No, no, hardly. Right. So same thing, anxiety describes a state of your body's chemistry. What it turns out that anxiety is just like a barometer that just indicates the level of your stress chemicals. Yeah. When you feel anxious, then you go, okay, my stress chemicals are up. And when you feel relaxed, you go, well, these other chemicals are up. Yeah. That's it. Now, again, it's a million-to-one ratio. So the conscious brain, again, only processes about 40 bits of information per second compared yeah. to 11 million per second for the unconscious brain. The problem that humans have, which we call the curse of consciousness, is that we do, we know that thoughts, unpleasant thoughts, go to a similar part of the brain that a physical threat does. You get the same chemical response. The problem that humans have is that we can't escape our thoughts. Yeah. I think the essence of chronic pain, it turns out that the mental pain is a much bigger problem than the physical pain, because generally you can escape it, goes to the same part of the brain, and then remember the sensation of anxiety is designed to be unpleasant enough that it compels you to take action to escape it and survive. Yeah. But what happens when you can't escape your thoughts, you're trapped, your body kicks in, your, your body kicks in even more stress chemicals to try to escape, and then the higher level of stress chemicals are anger. Yeah. So basically, anger and anxiety are the same thing. Oh, what happens, we have these sustained levels of stress chemicals. The emotional pain goes to the same part of the brain as the physical pain. You can't escape it. And the essence of chronic pain, by the way, is anxiety. Anxiety actually is the pain. Yeah. Wow. Then you talk about the central nervous system. How does that become involved? And in, uh, that perpetuates your uh, suffering even after the initial cause of the pain has subsided in some cases, doesn't it? Well, actually in all cases. In other words, no. okay, we have sustained exposure to these thoughts. You can't escape them. But what, it's, what it is, it's not a psychological problem. It's a programming problem. Oh, so, for instance, if you're a musician trying to learn a high-level concert piano, well, you'll practice for hours and hours per day. Yeah. It's a, literally a miracle what I think what a concert pianist can do on the piano. Yeah. But your brain, it's not muscle memory, it's neurological memory. In other words, your brain changes in a way that allows you to play the piano like that, right? Yeah. Your brain memorizes that skill. 
Well, same thing with pain impulses. You have these more unpleasant thoughts come into the brain like a machine gun, and those pain impulses become memorized much faster than a concert pianist trying to learn, learn how to play the piano. Yeah. And what happens is that once they're in the brain, they get memorized, just like riding a bicycle. <laughs> once you understand how to ride a bicycle, you actually can't unlearn how to ride a bicycle. These are permanently embedded pathways. Yeah. In fact, the definition of chronic pain is that it's an embedded memory that becomes embedded, I'm sorry, that becomes connected with more and more life experiences, and the memory can't be erased. Oh, we know that process occurs between about three to six months. The reason why back pain is so common, because that's what people injure. I mean, back pain is a common injury. Yeah. We know the biomechanics of the human body aren't great for spine support. So what happens, you injure your back, which hurts. I've been through two back surgeries myself. Yeah. It's incredibly uncomfortable. There's lots of anxiety around the pain associated with the back injury. Then you may have some other life stresses happening at the same time. And then you have this elevated body chemistry. And the other thing that happens with chronic elevation of your stress chemicals is that people get sick. And what happens is that there's 50 trillion cells in the body. Every one of them is affected by the body chemistry. Each organ system responds in its own way. When your body's full of stress chemicals, why other symptoms occur like irritable bowel syndrome, spastic bladder, Mm -hmm. migraine headaches, burning sensations, PTSD, fibromyalgia. But as a result of the body's chemistry, and what happens with the body chemistry is that that stress chemical environment doubles the nerve conduction, it changes the pain threshold, you begin to feel pain that you would, would not ordinarily feel. Mm, again, that's based on your body's chemistry. Yeah. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, the approach you labeled direct your own care. Uh, uh, how does that differ from the conventional approach of relying fully upon a qualified physician for your healing? I like the uh, your old book, Back in Control, talks about this, but what is direct right. your own care? Well, what happens in medicine right now, chronic pain is complicated. It's a complex process. It's affected by sleep, stress, medications, exercise, diet, nutrition, etc. All, all of those things make a difference. What we're doing in medicine, we're throwing random simplistic solutions at a complex problem. What the DOC project does, what the book does, it gives you, first of all, a context of care, so you, first of all, understand chronic pain, how it works yeah. and why it works. Once you understand the problem, then you have a shot at solving it. Then what the DOC project does, it breaks each person's pain into its individual components of what's the problem. For instance, sleep is a huge deal. For mm-hmm. some people, sleep is not a big deal. So what happens is you say, okay, sleep's a problem. Then there's a chapter in the book that goes into how you deal with sleep, mostly self-directed, Maybe you need your primary care physician's control. But what it does is that the DOC project is a framework that breaks pain into component parts. And then as you address each component part separately but simultaneously, that's how you solve the problem. Oh. And the metaphor I use is like fighting a forest fire. It takes multiple strategies to fight a forest fire. Everything counts. Same thing in chronic pain. Everything works a little bit in chronic pain, but nothing works in isolation. Yeah, what, what I like so much about the, the you take control of your own diagnoses, and obviously you consult with trained medical professionals, but uh, you take primarily res- a primary responsibility for curing yourself, and you you believe in that. And the more educated you become, and the more uh, in consultation with uh, medical professionals, the more on top of it uh, you are, the better, uh, the less stress you feel and the more the prospects of a, a happy ending, I think. So the, right. Well, the data shows, like I said before, only 20% of physicians are comfortable managing chronic pain. Less than 1% enjoy it. And I give lectures around the country really teaching people how to enjoy the management of chronic pain. Mm-hmm. We're solving it. I mean, it's, it's so exciting to see people that are totally trapped, totally helpless. And we're trapped by anything, finances, relationships, whatever. It's frustrating, but there's often an end point. The problem with chronic pain is, where's the end point? Yeah. You keep getting bounced around, you're told to live the best you can with it, et cetera, et cetera. What's been exciting for me is that the number one thing that happens is that the anxiety drops. Oh, yeah. And as the anxiety drops, creativity comes back, and at some tipping point, people's lives take off a level that they have never experienced even before they had chronic pain. Because remember, anxiety is necessary. You can't get rid of anxiety, otherwise you wouldn't survive. You can't get rid of anger because that's a part of anxiety. Yeah. 
The goal here is actually not to solve anxiety or conquer anxiety, because again, it's that million to one ratio of the unconscious versus the conscious brain. Mm -hmm. But you learn to process it in a way that it doesn't take you down. So for instance, stress isn't the problem, it's a chemical reaction to the stress. And I'll just ask you a rhetorical question that nobody has the answers to, because but I'll just ask the question anyway, <laughs> where, okay, anxiety, I think you saw my point where anxiety is just a descriptor of your state yeah. of your body's chemistry. Yeah. So if you're anxious, it means your stress chemicals are elevated, right? Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you decrease anxiety? It's easier now, the, to uh, theoretically answer sometimes than it is to do it, but... Uh... Well, no, and I'm going to, I'm being a little bit silly here, but I'm I, I just want to, I'm only, I'm just trying to make a point is that yeah. if anxiety is simply a measure of your body's level of stress chemicals, the way you deal with anxiety is you lower the stress chemicals. Yeah. Now there's a bunch of ways of doing that, and I point out there's two ways of doing that. One of them is to directly do a little bit of mindfulness meditation relaxation. For instance, as you're sitting there, just drop your shoulders for a second, you know, listen to sounds, and you're changing sensory input which yeah. changes the output, therefore it decreases the anxiety or decreases yeah. the level of stress chemicals. Okay, so there's direct ways of doing it. Mindfulness, meditation, relaxation, exercise, et cetera, all of them directly decrease the levels of stress chemicals and decrease the anxiety. That's why mindfulness and meditation work. But what you want for sustained relief of anxiety is, and both of these are important, one of them is directly, but also through neuroplasticity, you actually change the structure of your brain you decrease the reactivity oh, wow. of your nervous system. Instead of being stress automatic survival response, you have stress, a little bit of a space, then you choose a more appropriate, less reactive response. What happens is your brain, your brain changes by the second is you start choosing these more appropriate responses, then you start changing your brain. Oh. And what happens is that the reactivity of the nervous system drops down dramatically, stress chemicals drop down dramatically, and again, stress isn't the problem. It's a chemical reaction to it. But as you temper that reaction, anxiety drops through the floor. And it's just oh, remarkable man. how much creativity comes back when, when the, these levels of anxiety drop. Hmm. Well, that's great. Well, let's talk about uh, a bit about your acclaimed bestseller, Back in Control. Is your book a magic formula for eliminating back pain? If not, what is it intended to accomplish? Well, the answer, I'll say tongue-in-cheek, the answer is yes, <laughs> but let me just say something here. So it's a concept book. In other words, again, it breaks pain into a different parts. Each person, the three parts of getting better are three things. One is understanding the problem. The second part is treating every aspect of it simultaneously. Yeah. And the third part, which is most critical, and if you think about this carefully, it's the only way it can be done is that the patient takes complete control. Yeah. The book has only established medical practices in it, since each person is so unique and individual, why, by definition, the only person that can really solve the problem is the person. Yeah. And then, you know, again, once you start sorting through all the data, the different tools, and what you're going to do, it's incredibly easy, by the way. This is not a hard process at all. It's about 90% self-directed. Hmm. Most people have gone to pain-free. I've watched hundreds of patients go to pain-free. They've done it pretty much on their own. Yeah. And so, again, the book is this context of why you're doing mindfulness, why you're doing relaxation, why you're taking medications, et cetera, et cetera. But it allows, once you have that context of treatment, then you understand what the different tools do at different spots, allows you to take control of your care. It turns out the book is actually more or less a primary care wellness book. Oh. You can't really solve chronic pain. You really move away from pain into wellness. Let me just, I mean, let me go back to this whole thing about anxiety and pain for a second. There's direct ways of decreasing the stress chemicals. The other way of neuroplasticity is decreasing the reactivity of your nervous system. And the metaphor I like to use is like learning a new, a new language. For hmm. instance, if you want to learn French, you'll take the classes, you, you do repetition. But let's say in five years you can speak French, something happened to your brain, right? Yeah, your brain now has new connections, new myelin, and whatever to allow you to speak. In other words, your brain memorizes new language. Yeah, you didn't learn French by just avoiding speaking English, <laughs> no. right? No, that's for so sure. French didn't emerge. So you had to you had to pick out what you wanted to learn and pay attention on to the French, and eventually your brain changes a way to actually now speak French. 
the same thing with chronic pain. We do know that the automatic default language is survival. That means hyper alert, stress chemicals, etc. We know that thoughts come to the same part of the brain as a physical threat. Turns out that by far and away, the mental pain is a bigger problem than the physical pain, even though the physical pain such as back pain can start the process. But you can't come out of chronic pain by trying to fix the pain. You have to create a different nervous system, different from the automatic survival one. The default language is survival and stress chemicals, right? Yeah. I call the new language an enjoyable life, which means you pick a vision of what you want in your life. And that's with or without the pain, by the way. Because remember, if you're trying to fix the pain, your attention's on the pain. And what you're doing with neuro, you have to think in terms of neuroplasticity, not psychology. Yeah. For instance, one of the classic starting points for treating chronic pain is that I don't allow my patients to ever discuss their pain with uh-huh. anybody. Their, their provider, I mean, they talk to the providers briefly, but no family, no friends, no colleagues, no talking about the pain. Well, that's because great. Your, that's because a great idea just to eliminate talking about it. takes a lot right. of it away. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, because where's your attention? Yeah. And so what happens is that people, I didn't realize this, but and I understand it. I actually went through this myself. Is I'm on this endless quest to solve the pain. I'm asking questions. I'm on this endless quest. I became what I would call an epiphany addict. I just was looking for that one answer to solve my pain. And each time you try something that doesn't work, you become more and more disappointed and despondent. Yeah. And it gets pretty dark. I mean, it's a pretty bad spot to be. But the bottom line is you create a vision. What do I want in my life? What do I want my life to look like? You start pursuing that vision, understanding that the pain circuits are permanent. They'll keep intruding into your day, day after day. They're never going to go away. But what happens is like directing a river into a different channel. You dig a little bit of a ditch. The water starts to flow. You keep d- digging a bigger ditch. and Eventually, you have a channel where the water starts creating its own pathways. And that's you use not entirely path- different from the uh, popular concept of the law of attraction. Obviously, you're digging that new pathway or ditch or whatever you want to call it to where you want to be, and you have a clear vision of where you want to be. And, uh, right. That helps you overcome where you're concentrating in the past right. on that pain. Where people get in trouble is that they use what I call positive affirmation or positive thinking. Yeah. But this is actually just a way of suppressing negative thinking. And as you well know, when you try to suppress your thoughts, you think about things more. Yeah. But what is really critical, I call it positive substitution, it's really critical to create that vision. So a positive oh. vision, positive outlook is absolutely yeah. critical to, uh, to, to solving chronic pain. But the other metaphor is like developing a virtual desktop on your computer. As you develop this new set of circuits, they don't have pain. Hmm. Right? Yeah. And that's... so, again, you don't learn French by trying to fix your English. You're not going to come out of chronic pain by trying to fix chronic pain, right? I ain't got nowhere trying to do that. <laughs> right. Well, it's not my bad golf swing. You know, I, I realize it. it's interesting that just even the last year, I've had, I mean, one of my golf instructors at one point said, look, you have put in more energy and more effort than anybody I've ever seen with the least success of anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> That's not exactly a compliment. <laughs> that wasn't a compliment. And I realized just even about a year ago, I was well, wait a second. <clears throat> the key issue is that I was trying to fix this bad swing instead of creating what I wanted to create. Yeah. And I would. I'd go to the driving range, and I would just keep trying to fix this, fix this, fix this. Yeah. I also remember an interview with Jack Nicklaus, the greatest golfer of all time. Are you a golfer by chance or, or no? Oh, <laughs> a few times. Not recently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm a bad golfer. I haven't played for a couple of years. But I, I, in the 1990s, I was sort of obsessive about it, or a lot of obsessive about it, and I was really into mm-hmm. this thing. But anyway, Jack Nicklaus is the greatest golfer of all time. And I remember reading an article in Golf Digest about him, and one of the reporters had asked him about a certain bad shot that he made. And he just looked, looked at the report and goes, what bad shot? And he just concentrated on the good shot, good shot, good shot, and what he liked about his swing and what he wanted to do. And... He just didn't spend time on the negative thoughts and the negative part of the swing. So he wasn't trying to fix that flaw. He was trying to actually create what he wanted to create. And I thought that was a pretty nice example about how you can sort of create that vision and move forward. But it's a really powerful tool. And again, it's not positive thinking, but a positive vision is actually a huge part of this process. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's so true. Well, where's the uh, best place for listeners to go to preview and purchase your book? I suspect it's um, widely available. But, uh, 
Yeah, it's on Amazon. It's also in Barnes and Nobles, and it's also different bookstores around the country have it. It's called Back in Control: A Surgeon's Roadmap Out of Chronic Pain. It's a second edition. There's a website that's completely open source. Don't even need an email to get on it. It's called backincontrol.com. Yeah, I noticed be- that website has some great blogs and videos and podcasts and a whole lot of good stuff. So I would highly recommend listeners go to that backincontrol.com website because it's got a lot of good stuff on it. And I designed the website to be the action plan of the book. Because, I mean, the book, you read a book, it is what it is. But you have to actually learn the tools to actually auto-regulate your body chemistry. So just going way back in the conversation, what's the goal of the book? The goal is to connect to your own capacity to heal, which means you learn to auto-regulate your own body's chemistry from stress chemicals to play chemicals. And when you're full of play chemicals, by the way, it's a pretty nice life. Yeah. It really its a huge difference in your sense of well-being. Your body functions better. And it's really, it's really based on awareness, separation, reprogramming, which means, and the part that people object to, and it's a learned skill, you have to actually feel, you have to allow yourself to feel the anxiety before you can redirect, right? Yeah, that's so true. And the, I mean, the process is based on awareness. You can't change things that you're not aware of. No. So you have to allow yourself to feel angry, you have to allow yourself to feel anxiety, and then you take a little bit of a space, then redirect. And then once you get the, it's a learned skill, and again, I've been triggered I mean, this for 20 years. I, I get triggered pretty badly some days, and I just understand it's a matter of just processing it and going to the next step. But, uh, yeah, there's no beginning or end point to the process. It's just a learned skill of how do you deal with these stress chemicals. As you learn to auto-regulate your own body's chemistry, it just changes the game and your quality of life dramatically. Well, uh, in conclusion, presumably, like a lot of you during middle age, I've had extended intervals of uh, chronic back pain. And in most cases, it was impossible to pinpoint the uh, immediate cause or to identify any injury or strain that brought it on. But after today's conversation, I realized that stress and anxiety may have helped uh, uh, less, worsen the pain. And thank the Lord in every instance, after a couple of weeks, the pain went away. I can only imagine how devastating it would be for the pain to linger indefinitely. And as Dr. David Hanscom points out, rather than depending solely upon the advice of medical practitioners, it only makes sense to take control of your own healing without doubt with advice and counsel from fully qualified medical professionals and to design the permanent healing method right for you. And you and you alone can become aware of all the personal variables that impact your perception of pain. And the good news, as Dr. Hanscom puts it, the more you discover about factors causing your chronic pain and ex- medications and actions you can take to lessen it, the lower your anxiety levels will become. And as you begin to recover using uh, Dr. Hanscom's direct your own care, you'll start uh, losing the feeling of hopelessness. And as you become better educated, your anxiety levels will de- decrease. And in most cases, your recovery will become a self-fulfilling prophecy without the needs of surgery or addictive medication. And Lord knows nobody wants that. And if you or a loved one suffer from chronic pain, I highly recommend Dr. Hanscom's book, Back in Control. And who can tell it better than a couple of reviewers on Amazon? One said, I can say without reservation, this is the best chronic pain book I've ever read. And another said, I began recommending uh, that my uh, wellness center clientele read this book immediately, not only folks with back pain, but those with any kind of pain issue. And thank you so much, Dr. David Hanscom, for your sound chronic pain advice and best of success on your continued sale of your book and in helping folks all around the world out of that chronic pain of this. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the conversation. Obviously, you know a lot about this already, and it was very nice talking to you and trying to deepen those concepts. So, no, I really appreciate this. No, you make it uh, very clear, a very complex subject, quite clear, and uh, I hope that everyone will get a benefit out of this. And thank you so much for joining us here today. You're welcome. Well, thank you, Dr. David Hanscom, for describing the connection for so many of us between chronic pain and high levels of stress and anxiety. And here's why it matters. 
stress and pain are especially acute in the U.S., and they're very hazardous to our health here. According to an article in the April 26, 2019 USA Today, about a third of the people worldwide were stressed, worried, and in pain last year, and more than half of Americans feel pressure and strain. That's according to the 2019 Global Emotions Report, Gallup's annual statement, or snapshot of the world's emotional state. The United States, well, we're more stressed than almost anybody else. Most Americans, 55%, recalled feeling stressed during much of the day in 2018. That's more than all but three other countries, including top-ranking Greece, 59%, and they have a bad economy to worry about, uh, which has led the world in stress since 2012. Nearly half of all Americans felt worried, 45%, and more than a fifth, 22%, felt angry last year, they told Gallup. Up from 2017, Americans' stress represented an increase, too, topping the global average by 20 percentage points. And uh, even as our economy roared, more Americans were stressed, angry, and worried last year than they have been at most points during the past decades. You wonder why, don't you? Julie Ray, a Gallup editor, uh, wrote that in a summary report. In fact, Americans were more stressed than residents of Chad, a North American or North African country uh, that's beset by violence and rated as the worst country economically and uh, from a political standpoint to live in in the world. 51% of Chadians reported stress last year compared to 55% of Americans. Is there any logical reason why we should be more worried and stressed out than the poor folks who live in Chad? I think not. Well, the good news, as Dr. Hanscom points out, it only makes sense to take charge of your own healing, discover precisely what factors in your life, real or imagined, are causing so much worry and stress, and then take active steps to avoid or diminish them. And believe me, once you take control of your life, you can do that. And once you begin directing your own care, you'll start uh, losing that feeling of hopelessness and joy and purpose will start returning to your life. And also you'll be surprised to learn that chronic pain is decreasing. And that's today's program. Don't forget my book all about midlife renewal and the steps you need to take to get there. That's called The Midlife Challenge Wake Up by Roy C. Richards. You can find it on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com. And that's it for today. Join us again next week on Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age. You've been listening to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age, hosted by Roy Richards, an expert on midlife renewal and author of both A Midlife Challenge, Wake Up, and Wake Up, Captain and Crew, Restart Your Engines. You can learn more about Roy and his Middle Age Renewal Training System by visiting his website, middleagerenewal.com. 